In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment a bit difficult, like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who've never treated you like a part of the family, or maybe the person you just met who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words as yourself became as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love. And he put this love on display on a daily basis with his disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, he gave his life, dying so that they and we might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of his followers not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so, not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update, but because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love. Make you want to two-step this morning. Two-step down the aisle. We are so happy to have you all in worship, both in person and online. Uh, mark your calendars because we want you to join us on July the 3rd. We are hosting our summer connection event Sunday night at the Bex. There will be water inflatables, old-fashioned games, snacks, and fireworks. And if that's not enough, Sweet Treat Snow Cone Truck will be there serving delicious snow cones as well. All you need to do is bring a lawn chair. And if you don't have that, all you need to do is bring yourself and a friend. It will be the first of several summer activities intended to help us know one another and connect with one another a little bit better. 
everyone is welcome inside and outside these walls. So you bring us the crowd and we will minister to that crowd. It is a very, what we've tried to do is provide a fun way of growing a Christ-centered, compassionate church connecting all to God's love. The family tables have activities to connect children to worship. Please take advantage of those. And there's a more private space right down the hallway and to your right if that space is needed. Visitors, make sure that you grab one of our FCC summer cups. Those are our gift to you. Please take just a minute and fill out the connection card inside. Drop it in the offering plate so that we can connect with you in the manner that you prefer. Eden and Brinley are back from a weekend at Discovery Camp. And Tucker, who attended junior camp with his friend Jack, is also back. Make sure you ask them about their week experiences. Aiden will be heading off to make promises happen tomorrow. So keep Aiden in your thoughts and prayers. And Gina will be heading off to make promises camp later on this summer. So pray for her experience as well. We are so excited to be a part of those camping experiences for each and every one of those campers. We have two, oh. What time is that? 7.30, 7.30, yes ma'am, thank you. We have two international mission projects that we hope you will all support. The first is the giving jar that you'll see on the communion table out in the narthex. That will benefit World Central Kitchen, which provides relief efforts to those in the Ukraine. The supplies that you see collecting up front will be going with us to Jamaica July the 9th through the 16th. A list of the other items that are needed are on the table out in the North X. If you would be willing to join our mission efforts, then please grab a list and bring those supplies and put them right up here on the table. Thank you so much to those of you who have already contributed. Your efforts, no matter how small, are just a huge part of our mission success. We'll be commissioning that group uh, for service at the conclusion of worship today and meeting with the team after the service. So please be keeping that group in your thoughts as prayers as well. We're going to be kicking off a Bible study mid-July. There are two options for you to join. You can join online on Tuesdays at 1030 with the polo group. Or you can join us in person at Brentwood on Wednesday evenings at 630. The study is Ann Voskamp's Waymaker. And if you're interested, you can sign up on the sheet that's right outside on the ledge, uh, outside the office. Ashley and I will contact you and get you more details and information. That's a lot. Let's bow and pray. God, we really want to love you above all else. We want to love others as we love ourselves. As sweet, friendly affirmed this morning as we stood in the narthex, we can't love others if we don't love ourselves. And that love only comes as we connect with the God of all creation, realizing that we were created on purpose with intention for a purpose. Teach us how we can love you and love others better. Equip us to serve unselfishly, to love unconditionally. We gather today confident that you are here. You are in our midst. As we lift up our praise and our worship, our prayers and our petitions, as we dig deep into your word, accomplish your good and perfect will among us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Draw your attention now to even more life of the church.
Good morning, everyone. Please stand if you're able and worship with us.
cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me. Will you bow with me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and time set aside to worship you. Help guide us in our worship together this morning. Help provide fresh revelations of your word and your abundant love for each one of us. Please be with those names listed on the prayer list and those listed only on our hearts. May they find healing in your love and comfort in your presence. We continue to lift up those who are called to lead. May they be guided by your wisdom and protection. Lord, thank you always for the gift of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brinley volunteered earlier to help me out with the creative connection. And if there are other kids here that would like to come forward and help us, we invite you to do that. So come on forward now. 
And oh, yay, Ransom is here. I didn't see you come in. Good morning. So glad you're here. Welcome. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to get one of you on each side. The rest of you, come on up. If there's anybody else that wants to help, come up here with us. Good morning, Keely. So glad you're here. Good morning, Max. Good morning, Kenley. Good morning. So glad you're here. It looks a little leery about all this. It's all right, Max. We're safe. I promise. Where's Beckham? Beckham, come up here with us. You want to come up here with us? Brindley could use your help. You think about it. Any of you decide to come up later, come on up. I promise we're not scary. So a few weeks ago, we started working on memorizing Matthew 22, 37 through 40. We cut out some words. Do you remember what words we cut out? Do you remember? We took out the use and the yours. So the use and the yours. So we're going to say it together. I've got it here, but the blanks are either a you or a your. So help us out. You ready? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Brindley had this idea that we like to learn scriptures when we do jam with motions, all right? So everybody up on your feet, they're going to teach you some motions so that you can do this scripture as well. Yay, come on up, Beckham. So we're starting out this way. Brindley, you're going to have to lead and help everybody. Are you ready? It starts out like this. You shall love the Lord your God. All right, let's try that again. Oh my gosh, I knew it. Show me the step. Oh, I did. All right, so that's why I have you here. So let's show everybody else how Sandra did it wrong. Are you ready? You shall love the Lord your God. Did I do it right that time? Okay, so you ready? With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All right, we're going to do that much together. Are you ready? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. Now you got to take the hand of somebody next to you. All right. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now we're going to put it all together. Can we do it? Are you ready? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Look, give yourselves a hand. I think they learned it. I think they learned it. You guys are great teachers. All right. We bow your heads and we're going to say a quick prayer. God, man, we want to do that. We want to learn to love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. And we want to love our neighbors as ourselves, but we cannot do it in our own power. Enable us to be all that you've called us to be so that we can teach these kids by example and we can learn by their example. Help us to love others. Help us to see others through your eyes and love others as you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What about removing a word? Well, we didn't remove a word this week because we're doing that next week. We can't do it all in one week, Brindley. Can't happen. But I appreciate your encouragement and you're keeping me in line. All right? God gifts, they're God gifts. Oh, 
This is the third week of our Ten Commandments sermon series, week one. We covered the importance and the relevance of studying the Ten Commandments. It may seem like an odd series to kick off the summer with. I mean, it doesn't hardly compete with Top Gun Maverick unless you dig a little deeper. And then it's pretty dadgum awesome stuff. These are God's ten words. The Hebrew word translated in English as commandment is debar or word. So these are God's words on living into the freedom that he's provided for people. In the story of God, God saves the people from the abuse of Pharaoh. He sets them free from Egyptian captivity. And then God gives them these words about behavior designed to maintain that freedom. This order is so important. The Ten Commandments, the law, is not a means to salvation. Salvation is a gift of God. The commandments are God's guidance on maintaining that God-given freedom. Last week, we studied what is called the first table or the vertical table, guidance on our actions that connect us with God. Put God first, according to that scripture, and everything else is going to fall into place. It also instructs us not to worship idols. Now, those are really easy words to say, a little harder to follow, because few of us manage to keep God first and foremost in our lives. We worship people, we worship places, we worship things. We just struggle to admit, and we are slow to identify what it is that we worship. If you think of it this way, where do you invest your time, your money, your thoughts? Where do you place your hope? Or where do you turn when you need comfort, when you're in despair? If God is not your immediate answer, then you are likely guilty of breaking the first two commandments. That's where the third commandment comes in. Do not use God's name in vain. We've been taught that that means don't use God's name as a swear word. Don't use it as slang. And that's definitely a good practice, but it's so much more than that. Do not use God's name in vain means that you use God's name in the way that it was intended. We use God's name when we need forgiveness. We call on God's name when we're in trouble. And we praise God's name when things are good. We live lives mindful that we wear the name Christian just like we wear an article of clothing. We are children of the king of the universe bringing glory and honor to his name instead of shame. We treat people with respect and kindness. We offer the forgiveness that we ourselves have received. We love people the way that we ourselves are loved. We are people of dignity and honor, a chosen people, according to Scripture, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart to bring good into the world. That's who we are, whether we feel like it or not. That's who the Bible says. That's God's claim on every person in this room today. Finally, we practice Sabbath, and again, it's so much more than a Sunday in church. It's not only setting aside a day of the week to focus on God, to rest and to recover. It's a day that ensures that others get rest also. It's a day of caring for the well-being of others. And even more than just that, it's a whole system, a lifestyle of forgiveness and sharing and caring and stewardship. Confidence that we can stop for the day and it's the world's not going to stop. Confidence that as we care for the needs of others, we can trust that God will care for our needs. That he allows us to be a part of the process of making the world a better place. If you missed last week, you missed the details of how all that works. And it's 
really, really good stuff. I'm just so sad that you missed it. Today, we have to move on to the second table, which is the horizontal table that governs our connection with others. So first we reach up and we connect with God and then we reach out. You see that, right? We reach up and then we reach out. The shape, the shape of the cross. Miss Brinley is going to come up and read scripture for us today. Please follow along in your Bibles as she reads. Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 through 16. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the reading and for the hearing of Scripture, and we pray that your words minister to our hearts and minds this day. We pray for eyes to see, for ears to hear, for hearts receptive, and for minds open. Guide us through the hearing of your word into your good and perfect will. Amen. Last week, I shared vaguely about an encounter that I had with a lady through my work here at the church who made an incredible impact on me. While I was trying to help her, she shared with me that she had prayed repeatedly that God would use her uh, to help people, but she just didn't feel like God had answered that prayer. I assured her that she was wrong in that assumption, that even in my brief encounter with her, she had taught me many lessons and helped me grow my faith. I'm not sure she believed me, even though it was very true. Preaching sermons on putting God first and loving others as you love yourself seemed very hypocritical last week. Lots of weeks, actually. I can't lead you into doing something that I am rarely able to accomplish myself most days. But I was reminded through this encounter that just as God used this woman bound to her American trash, hindered and held back from so much that life has to offer, God could use me too, just as I am. God doesn't wait until we have obtained perfection to use us for his glory. God really is in the business of turning a mess into a message of creating beauty from chaos. It's one thing to hear those words. It's another to witness examples of that in real life and to be an example of that yourself. And that's really good news for most of us. Baby dedications are always a really big deal. Um, Sometimes it is really difficult to organize a ceremony that conveys just how meaningful it is that these parents want to set aside an occasion to signify their desire to invite God into the upbringing of their children. That was part of my struggle last week. I mean, what actions really represent that? In addition, as I worked to set aside a time to connect first and foremost with God, I was bombarded with issues, one after another, problems of others that were way beyond my ability to fix. I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable here. I still have not wrapped my mind around being called to be the minister of this congregation. I sit in the office every week. I do the job to the very best of my ability, but it still seems very surreal. Every week is a mix of contradictions. It is the best job in the world, and it is the hardest job in the world. Last week, my ongoing mantra was, 
God, I trust you to do what I cannot do and to say what I cannot find the words to say. The one thing that I do know is that God is ever and always faithful in every situation, in every circumstance. God has never failed me. We'll circle back here in just a minute. I probably should talk about the scripture. Um, there's a big misconception among Christians and non-Christians that the Ten Commandments are just no longer relevant. We fight about posting them in public places. Many of us seem to make the commandments themselves an idol of worship. In some minds, they were never relevant. It's just a made-up story after all. It should be given little regard. I would challenge those of that mindset to give it a little deeper study and investigation. I can't imagine that if you really dig into this story, you wouldn't find the relevance. For many Christians, the relevance ended with Jesus. I mean, Jesus came to do away with the law, right? Again, further investigation will reveal that is not the truth. Here is what Jesus spoke about the commandments. Listen to what he said about just a few. About the commandment, you shall not murder. Jesus said, anyone who's angry with father or mother, sister or brother is subject to judgment. About you shall not commit adultery. Jesus says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his or her heart. Do not steal. If anyone wants to sue you, Jesus says, take your shirt and give him your coat as well. Do not give false testimony. Jesus says everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. I think you'll agree. It doesn't sound like Jesus came to do away with the commandments. If anything, he seems to be saying we should put greater effort and more intention about listening and striving to follow God's word, understanding it is our ticket to remain in the freedom and the release provided by God. We have to give it our best, to give it our all, our whole heart, soul, and mind. Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments this way, love God and love others. There's another promise that we need to keep in mind. Jesus said, I go again to be with the Father, but I leave someone with you. I leave with you a helper. He'll be with you and in you. And he will guide you and teach you and equip you and enable you. We have not been left as orphans alone. We are not left in our own power and our own strength and by our own might to accomplish the big task of loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind and loving others as we love ourselves. We have someone within us, the power of the mighty God living within us to accomplish that purpose and task. Last week, we dedicated three baby boys. I knew the name of the meaning, Theo, and I wanted to investigate the meaning of the other two, but last week was just so busy that I did not have time. This week, that desire was still there. That prompting remained, and so I decided I needed to make time. I want to share with you what I found. Bodhi means awakening, enlightenment. I was enlightened by a few things last week. Number one, did you see how happy those three little guys were last week? Every single one of them, best smiles ever. Their whole faces beamed when you talked to them. What incredible joy. I was worried because one of the three was my own, and as amazing as that joy was to be able to be a part of the dedication of my grandson, it provided a challenge, which was I didn't want to be partial. I wanted to give each of those babies due attention. I worried needlessly because did you see the love those boys were surrounded by? Each one with sets of grandparents that love and support and encourage them. And then all of you stepped in and added more love on top of love. And that, my friends, is how the church is supposed to work. 
Our mission is a collective effort. We should be working together to make sure that everyone knows just how special they are, created in the image of God with purpose. We can't minister to each and every one, but together we can make certain that no one is ever overlooked or left out. The success or the failure of the body of Christ, it is not my load to carry, thank God. It is not your load to carry on your own because no one of us can do it on our own. It is an absolute necessity that everyone work together guided by God. I so hope that you can keep the image of those little boys surrounded by love tucked away in your hearts and minds because God wants every person embraced that way. We are all God's precious children, all. Regardless of our age or our color or our gender, we are God's children. He dotes on us just like those parents and grandparents doted on those little boys last week. Even more because our hearts don't have the capacity to love the way our creator does. He looks at you with joy, unimaginable. He has plans for you beyond anything that your mind could ever have the capacity to imagine. God wants the best for you, a future with hope and promise. God loves you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you, every fault, failure, every shortcoming, and he loves you still. God wants us to be awakened and enlightened to the truth that he placed sweet baby Bodhi in our midst to remind us of our purpose and God's great love for us. The meaning of the name Emmett is universal truth. I gleaned this insight from my connection to baby Emmett. Like most babies, choosing a name for that baby boy was a process. Tyler didn't like all of Cassidy's choices and Cassidy didn't like Tyler's top picks. When they told us that they had picked Emmett, Rick and I both laughed because Rick's dad had a fishing buddy named Emmett. And Emmett was quite the character. He cussed like a sailor. He wore overalls. He was extremely rough around the edges, not the kind of person that you would immediately, uh, that would immediately come to mind when you were choosing a name for your first child. But Cassidy and Grandpa had this very special relationship. And I couldn't help but think, Somewhere he was smiling, having the knowledge of that coincidence. Cassidy was too young to have any recollection of Grandpa's fishing buddy, Emmett. Later we learned that my great-grandpa, Swan, was also named Emmett. Now, although I should have known that, I was not aware of that. So what's the universal truth revealed through Emmett? Well, I believe connection. Connection known and unknown, seen and unseen, could it be that God is at work trying to awaken us to the universal truth that we are all connected in and through our creator, that we are brothers and sisters connected whether we realize it or feel it? There's another part of the universal truth that I want to highlight. There are few joys that compare with watching your children parent, especially when they do it really well. Cassidy and Tyler both get to work from home, which uh, a big part of the time, which is one of the really good things that came out of the mess of COVID. Still, Cassidy is very intentional about making sure that Tyler gets his time with Emmett. Lots of weekends when he hangs out with us, she'll say, we need to get home. Tyler's going to want to see Emmett today. Emmett needs to spend time with his daddy. That is our job to connect our children, to connect God's children with their heavenly Father. There are so many ways that we have messed that up, so let me just simplify it for a minute. We just need to take advantage of every occasion to introduce God's children back to their daddy, to make absolutely certain that they know that God loves them and that God just wants to spend time with them. That we make sure that they're in places where they can experience that love for themselves. There are lots of things that compete 
for the attention of God's children, but nothing, nothing will benefit them more than ensuring that they have adequate time to know their father, to understand just how great his love is for us. That is our priority. That's our number one purpose. If we set aside all else and just make sure that every person God sends our way to encounter, that it's our goal to make sure they know before they leave our midst or our presence, God loves you. Do you know that? Do you know that God knows you and God just wants to spend time with you? The rules and the regulations for remaining in those freedom, that can follow. But first and foremost comes with the fact that God saves his people because God loves his people. Finally, there is baby Theo, a very special and unique situation. I looked up the name of Theo a while back because I assumed it had something to do with God, knowing that theology is the study of God. Theo means God gift. A little bit mind-blowing. Last week, Ashley said, our time with baby Theo has been harder than anything I could have imagined. It has been an emotional roller coaster of highs and lows. And yet, as emotional as it has been, I would not trade a moment of my time with Theo, not for anything. He has taught us so much. He has been a revelation in so many ways. He is. God gift, a gift that requires complete trust and reliance on the gift giver. Baby's, baby Theo's future is completely in God's hands. Ashley and Heath, they have little, if any, control. They've just been given this God gift to love and to trust God with their whole hearts, souls, and minds, that he who is the giver and protector of all life is working to fulfill his good and perfect plan in Theo's life, regardless of the situation and circumstances that he will encounter. We were gifted baby Theo for an hour last week and charged to pray for him, to encourage his family at every additional chance that we're gifted, to honor the time that God has given us by doing what we have been called to do trusting that God will use our efforts no matter how small or minuscule to accomplish much more that we could ever hope for or imagine. Baby Theo is representative of every person, every age that God sends our way. That our mission, and it can only be accomplished as we are a body and deeply committed and connected to connected to God, can only be accomplished as we put God first, setting all else aside, knowing that things will fall into their proper place and order when we center on Christ, up and out, up and out. The message of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, that guides us into remaining in the freedom that God has given us, up and out symbol of the cross. Do you see why it's so hard to put all of this into adequate words? One last thought to ponder and then I'll close. I want you to think just a minute about our music today. Just a closer walk with thee. Lead me to the cross. Still to come from the inside out and be thou my vision. These are songs that were chosen prior to hearing this message. The message was written prior to knowing that these were the songs that had been chosen. As I was typing the closing words of my message this week, I pulled up the songs just to look and see what they were. Guys, there is a higher power that is at work amongst us. In spite of our flaws and our faults and our shortcomings, that higher power is ever faithful. He loves us enough to involve us in the process of making the world a better place. I said these words in my neighborhood last week. We make the world a better place as we make our community a better place. 
We love the world as we love those that sit next to us, that are in our families, and that God has brought into our lives. May you have eyes to see that God is at work through the others that he gifts you. May you have that ability today and every day. Amen. Each week we offer a call to discipleship. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so and we will do our best to walk you through that process. If you do not have a community with whom you serve, our community is open to all. We would welcome and embrace you, invite you to be a part of this body of Christ and serve with us as we best know how. And a challenge to each and every one. I believe you're here today because God brought you here. I believe you heard that message because it was what God wanted to speak into your heart and mind what does God want to do with those words in your heart and mind is as uh, individual, as diverse as we are individuals. So during this song, I encourage you to use the time to meditate, to think about what God is saying to each and every one of you, and more to think about it, to answer in faithful obedience. times I failed still your mercy remains should I stumble again I'm caught in your grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame
God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God's ways are higher than our ways. The ways that he connects us with himself and others is so easy to overlook because there are so many distractions that we face continually. This table is one of the ways that God uses the ordinary to accomplish the extraordinary. At this church, all are invited, all are welcome, and all are encouraged to share in this meal, trusting that as we focus our hearts and our minds on the God of salvation, mercy, and grace, we receive those gifts through the bread and the cup. It's not something that we can understand or explain. It's something that we experience as we act in faith. Not by our efforts, but by a God who is ever and always faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into ever closer fellowship with yourself. We remember how you took the cup and proclaimed, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we partake of this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of what you did on our behalf and praise and glorify your holy name. Amen.
on the night that he was betrayed, Christ gathered with the disciples in the upper room, taking bread. He broke it, giving thanks. He said, this is my body. It is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he poured out the cup and giving thanks. He said, this blood represents, this wine represents my blood spilled out for the forgiveness of sins for all who will receive as you eat of this bread and as you drink of this cup. Do so in remembrance of me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Thanks be to God. I want to invite those that are here in worship today that are going to be a part of our mission team to Jamaica to come forward, please. If you're here and you're going with us to Jamaica, come on up, guys. Come on up and stand up up here. I want to tell you while they're coming up just a little bit about our team. We have 32 people that will be heading to Jamaica July the 9th through the 16th. Um, Half of that group are male and half of that group are female. We have all ages. Cy there is our youngest, and I'm sure that he wouldn't mind me saying that uh, Sonny, who's not here with us today, is our oldest. Uh, So we have uh, everything in between. Um, Eight of the members of our team have not served on a mission trip previously. The rest have all been on a trip at some time, some place. We have two Young ladies who aren't with us that are from San Antonio that are going with us on the trip. Harry Hammonds, who also was out of town today, is from Central Christian in Enid that's going with us. And then we have a mom and a school and her son, a school teacher and her son from Chandler that are going with us as well. Um, the region provided some scholarship money for people that were from out of the area to go with us. And the Disciples Foundation provided us with resources for this trip. Central Christian in Enid is letting us use their vans for transportation to get to the airport. They also provided $600 in scholarships and $500 uh, for supplies. And then as you see, uh, many of you have also provided lots and lots of supplies for the trip. We are going to be doing a lot of work. This is a collective, um, this, is, this is a collaborative thing. If you are a family member of one of these people, would you guys please stand for a minute? Not a minute, just stand up. Yeah, if you're at, not a minute, just stand. Family members, stand because that they're a part of this team and allowing their family members to go. I want to point out that Rick back on the sound booth is going with us. Gage and Logan are both going. Gage is upstairs on the camera. Gage is going with us as well. Um, If you have brought supplies or you will be bringing supplies for the trip, will you guys stand? And if you'll be lifting up in prayer, anybody that's going, everybody just stand up. All of you stand up. The whole group stand up and we're going to pray. All right, gracious and loving God, um, what an incredible opportunity that you've placed before us. And we pray that you help us to go with open hearts and open minds, ready to do the work that you've called us to do. We know that you laid out this experience before it was ever in our hearts and minds. And we just thank you for um, the help that will be provided by those that we go to serve and for the ways that we can make their lives better. We thank you so much for each and every one who's been part of our trip, not only by going, but by enabling us to go. For those that have um, brought supplies, the smallest of effort to the greatest of effort is all important and it all matters. We pray that um, just as you've called us today to be a people that go out into the world and share your love with others, that you enable us to do that effectively. We pray for safety and we pray for effectiveness and we pray for these that are behind, that you inspire them to encourage, pray, and listen to the amazing stories when we get home, knowing that they also were a part of it. Thank you for the work that you'll do in and through these. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Remain standing as I invite our light bringers up to carry out the light. We'll all walk out together. All right. So Tucker and Brinley, if you'll come up to carry out the light as we speak these words of benediction over one another. 
So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Thanks be to God. Oh, we have an extra, an extra light bringer. You are welcome. Come right on up. Don't be shy. Come on up, guys. I wish you were going there. 